He was never king on this earth, even though they expected him to be. All the disciples wanted him to be. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we come to your word of truth. And dear Lord, you know more than any of us the attacks on the Church of Jesus Christ from the beginning of the book of Acts until today. You know the darkness that has come into the churches century after century. How that many followed churches and were slaughtered and slain under Roman Catholicism. And uh, all the things that ha of history that have transpired. And how that your church is at the gates of hell, but the gates of hell shall not prevail against the true ecclesia, whoever they are, wherever they are, in whatever group they reside, in whatever country. Now we have done the book of Romans until chapter 8 because it is my consideration after all these years that all of us have failed to take into account the book of Romans from chapter 1 right through even to chapters 9 and 10 before we engage ourselves with chapter 11 which is a vital chapter for most people. And it is out of that chapter that they find a verse, one verse really, that gives an idea of a restored Israel. And we need to understand the whole book of Romans to do that. So we've done our chapters one to eight. And we saw the Israelites as a people given adoption as a nation of sons of Israel through the covenant at Horeb or Sinai. They had the glory, the glory of the ark, the glory of the pillar of by fire and of a cloud by uh, of a cloud by day and a fire by night. And let me emphasize. It's mentioned in Psalms that the glory was between the cherubim and we were taught it was the Shekinah. What a catastrophe. What a blasphemy. The Jews have put into our Bible. I have read it in their writings. It's in their Talmud. It's in their Kabbalah. The Shekinah, as we learned many months ago, is the goddess. And some say it is the female part of God by which he created the world. That's what they say. No Christian says that, I trust. But Christians are following them, in bed with them. How can two walk together except they be agreed? We need to agree with the Word of God. And so it is not the Shekinah as I was taught and have preached and have put in my books. So it's the glory of the Lord, not the Shekinah. The Shekinah is one of the ten emanations of the Sephiroth, of the Kabbalah not only the Kabbalah of the Jews, but the Kabbalah that goes way back before even Babylon. Well, this is what they had. They were a favored people. They were given the covenants of Abraham, the covenants of the law that was given through Moses. They were given the law itself. The law is good and holy. They were told to have a temple with its worship 
through animals sacrificed and through a priesthood. They were given the promises of Christ. That's the most wonderful thing that any nation could have been given in those days. And Israel was chosen to be given the promises of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he, basically, Christ, is the center of the whole of the Old Testament. You find Christ in every book of the Bible. And so the spread of the gospel of Christ came about, beginning with those of Israel, as we know, first of all by Jesus. And then it began with his apostles. They did not really preach the gospel when they were sent out, first the 12 and then the 72 of Luke 10. They preached that the Messiah was about to come to that town Get ready for him. That's what Jesus told them to preach. But the gospel began to be preached on the day of Pentecost, not in a foreign language. It was preached in Greek or Aramaic, certainly not Hebrew. It's written in Greek. And he did not preach another language. He used the language of the day so everybody could hear. Because even though they heard the foreign languages one by one, certainly thousands of people could never understand what 120 people was praying to God in other tongues, each with a different language. You could never understand it. But many of them understood that the languages, many of the languages they spoke, I did count it one day, I think it's about 22, the languages they knew. And they knew these men did not know those languages like that. So Peter then gets up to preach. He doesn't use other tongues. He uses the language of the day that everybody could understand. He began to preach the hope of Israel as announced by Jesus Christ. And that had been informed to Joseph in the names that he was to call the baby when he was born, Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus, not Yeshua, which is in the Talmud. I have a portion of the Talmud. And they say Yeshua is a curse on Jesus who was now burning in hell in excrement and he was born of Mary, a prostitute to a Roman soldier. How more blasphemous can you get than that about our glorious and pure and holy Lord Jesus? He is God. He was God with us. He was never king on this earth even though they expected him to be all the disciples wanted him to be. Even in Acts chapter 1, they were waiting for him to sit on the throne of David on earth. He never did sit on it and never will. Because as he said to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. His kingdom is a heavenly kingdom. Now in my early days of growing up, about 20 years, I was blessed to be in a Pentecostal church that was not particularly invaded with all these end time doctrines that the Americans are following today so avidly. In fact, I had a young Jew uh, comment. I don't know where he lives. Sometimes they think he might be in Sydney because he sends me a message when I'm in, doing them in the morning. And it, his family came out of Russia Jewish. He's the only Christian. And he wrote to me, he was absolutely appalled because he got on a, one of those chat things on the internet among Christians. He couldn't believe it. He was shocked. They were all adoring Israel. Now he thinks he is a descendant of Israel 
a Jew. Of course he's not. He doesn't know that. Doesn't matter. He's a Jew. And he was absolutely shocked to his boots that all these Christians were adoring Israel. There's only one person we are to adore. And it's not a nation. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. So God's mercy is given on whom he will, it tells us in Romans chapter 9. You can read it through for yourself and probably you already know a lot of Romans. Certainly some of you here would. You might even be able to quote it from memory. <laughs> I never could quote anything, a whole book from memory in all my life, but some people can. But we do remember the verses we learned, particularly as children and teenagers and later on in life. But in Hosea, as he says in Romans 9, God's going to have a people who are not his people, the Gentiles. So there will be at some stage of history, and there was. And it began in Acts chapter 10 with the preaching by Peter to Cornelius that there were two peoples receiving the gospel. The Jews, I'll call them the Jews, and the Gentiles. Two out of two natural people, there would be one people of God. You see that in the book of Ephesians, particularly Ephesians chapter 2 and other places. But as he says in Romans 9, from Isaiah, only a small remaining number or remnant would be saved out of all the Israelites whose number given to Abraham was like the sand of the sea, so innumerable, innumerable. But they it will be such a small number, only a remnant, and you find that scattered throughout the whole of the Old Testament, a remnant. It would only be a remnant. Why? Because a stone was put in their heart, their path, sorry, because a stone was put in their path. The stone became a rock of offence because he was the Lord Jesus Christ over whom they tripped and fell. They tripped and fell. But Paul says they weren't given the stone so that they would fall. Oh no. There's another reason they were given the stone. Because the stone was to become the stone was to become the cornerstone of the new temple of the New Testament. Who is Christ? And we are the new temple. As it says in Second Corinthians chapter six, verses sixteen around there. And as Peter said in one Peter two, verses six to about eleven, we are the holy nation. We believers of Jew and Gentile in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Peter says there that they had that rock of offence in that stone and they did trip over it. And he says, in the translation I have, as they were destined to do. In other words, God knew they would do it, of course. It, that sounds a bit stronger, but I won't go into that. Now, in Romans 10, Paul repeats his heart's desire and prayer for their salvation. He doesn't pray for them to be in their own land. Do you notice that? I'm sure we've all noticed that. Throughout the whole of the New Testament, there is no mention of them being in their new land, in their own land. The object is to get them saved like we are. From what are we saved? We're saved from sin and Satan and eternal hell and the wrath of God and an eternity in fire and brimstone. That's from which we are saved. And that's what the restoration 
as mentioned in the Old Testament concerns firstly their natural restoration which occurred definitely occurred except for the ten tribes they are lost to this day nobody has ever found them they are lost the two tribes also do not exist today but they were the tribes that existed at the time when Jesus was born Judea Judah and Benjamin but amongst them were many foreigners many Edomites they weren't pure stock of Abraham and we need to remember that also but salvation when you look at Romans 10 is of redemption from sin through the cross of Christ without the cross of Christ there would be no redemption from sin we are redeemed through the blood of Jesus in whom we have redemption through his blood according to the riches of his grace we are cleansed by the blood of Jesus we are sanctified by the blood of Jesus we are made holy by the blood of Jesus it's the redemption that is in Christ Jesus so the idea of chapter 10 is and we must remember that Romans was written AD 57 because that has an implication on our understanding of the book for, for most of us all of our lives have been a fairly long one we've had this attitude of taking the Bible and reading it avidly daily generally and uh, reading it from the point of view of getting something in us from it we were never taught to read it from the point of view of A to whom is it addressed B what period of history C what's their background what's their environment of life are they under law or are they under grace the same applies to the New Testament and we need to realize that the book of Romans was written in AD 57 not in 67, 77 or 87 it was written then it was not written in our day it was not written to us it was written for us as it turns out we have no record that any of those authors were ever told by God to write like they were in the Old Testament but of course they wrote and eventually we have our New Testament in English for which thank God and we do thank God because it's the Word of God that leads us to a knowledge of salvation particularly the New Testament so we need to remember that salvation was redemption from sin leading to eternal life and Paul says throughout all of those chapters there is a connection for Jew and for Gentile all of those chapters are about the matter of salvation first of all of sin that demands salvation and then justification or righteousness before God and how it occurs that's what those little chapters are all about and he makes a distinction as we have learned between the Jew and the Gentile the Gentiles of course are the worst sinners because they didn't have the light but then on the other hand the Jews who had the light have to be worse than that but he doesn't really say because God puts us all in one Romans 3 all have sinned Jew and Gentile and come short of the glory of God we just don't make it we don't hit the mark and many's the time when we preach that in the open air meetings that I'm sure the brethren used to have too and uh, because we told it to everybody for what it was it's the truth all of us have sinned so Paul classes them eventually as Jew and Gentile in sin he's not 
particularly that he is specifically in some way dealing with the Jews and dealing with the Gentiles. But when it's all boiled down in relation to God, they're not following him. The Jews really weren't. The, the Gentiles were so far away, they were without God and without hope in the world. The Jews had a, had a light of some sort. The Gentiles had no light. The Jews had a morality that the Gentiles did not have. The Jews were given the promises, the covenants, as we have read. They were far better off in that way. But when it boiled down to it all, the law was not able to give them that righteousness because they sought after it through works, as it says, of which it was impossible to attain. It's always by faith. It has to be by faith. So in Romans 10 and 9, Paul shows how we can be saved. And I'm sure we've all used that in pointing sinners to Christ. If you believe in your heart that Jesus died for your sins and that he rose from the dead, and if you confess with your mouth, Jesus, I believe, I confess you are my Lord and Saviour, you will be saved. And in verse 13, whoever calls on the name of the Lord, Jesus, shall be saved. So how, does, how is Israel to get faith? The same as the Gentiles will have to do, to hear the word of the faith of the gospel. And Paul says faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. There have to be preachers, which we all know, who preach the gospel by hearing the word of Christ. You, they were never to preach the law. You will not find in the New Testament, you will not find in the New Testament anybody who preached the law. They preached about the law as occasion demanded. They did not preach the law as the way of salvation. They did not preach an Israel restored as a nation as having anything to do with the gospel. It's just not there. Paul says, and he said it, these things. Year in and year out is what he's saying. It's gone out through all of Palestine, this is what he says in those chapter, to all the Israelites who were there and throughout the Roman Empire, they were all within reach of hearing the gospel because the apostles and Christians went everywhere. As we read in uh, Acts, the beginning of the book, where it says, because of the persecution, they were scattered everywhere everywhere all over Palestine, but everywhere all over Syria, everywhere all over Greece, everywhere all over the, the Roman Empire. They went everywhere to avoid the persecution and death that would ensue. You read about it in the book of Acts. So they heard the gospel. And he says something from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 32, 21. God said to Moses, I will provoke them with that which is not a people and I will anger them with a foolish nation because they angered me. He said, I brought them out of Egypt. And what really happened was because they angered God and he had to do something in anger to them, they fell. They brought it all on themselves. That's why they fell. They didn't fall because God made them. They brought it all on themselves and they fell. So Isaiah 65 verse 1, as he quotes, says, I was found of them who did not seek me. So Paul declares all this and proves what is said in Romans 10, 16. All 
Jews and Gentiles. Who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, but all are not saved. Not all the Jews ever, and not all the Gentiles ever. Now we live in a world of Gentiles and we know they're all not saved. We know most of them are not. We see the wickedness. Dear Lord, lead us into all truth. By your Holy Spirit, remove the scales from our eyes and the stubbornness from our hearts, in which all of us, every single one of us, we are prone to indulge. In Jesus' name, Amen.